Two years ago, Americans watched in horror as a crisis unfolded at the Kabul airport. There's desperation and anguish. More than 80,000 Afghans have since arrived in America. But this story is still unfolding. I'm Andrea Smartin. In my new podcast, Stranger Becomes Neighbor, we'll find out what happens to these new arrivals in our communities. Who would help our newest neighbors? Follow us at kslpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen. Now, this is a podcast called Project Recovery, and the majority of the podcasts are about people in recovery moving forward and sharing their story. But it would be great if it was more about prevention. I think we could incorporate some prevention. What do you say? Yeah, I mean, I think so, because, I mean, yeah, I would, I I mean, if you ask me right now, and I've got three beautiful kids at home, I, there well, nothing, but we, yeah, okay. shh, don't tell them okay. one. <laughs> um, but I, there's <laughs> two I mean, out of three. Ain't yeah, bad. yeah, yeah, meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, I would love for them not to have to go through all the stuff that I did. Of I course. would love for them to learn from my mistakes and not have to do some of the horrible and tragic things that have happened to me and that I've gone through. You're in treatment, but it'd be great if they could be in prevention. Yes. And so we got Heidi here with Use Only as directed. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks and, for having me. And is this a state run program? Yes. Use Only as Directed is a statewide initiative to bring awareness um, to using opioids as they are directed and also starting the conversation with our doctors um, to consider safe alternatives to opioids. Um, and we really appreciate the opportunity to look at this through a recovery lens and, and how um, we can incorporate uh, prevention with recovery, as you mentioned. So it's got to be safe to say for the past seven years, you've been really busy. Yeah. Yeah. This campaign um, has made a, a lot of progress and we believe that it's that it's making a difference here in our community and we plan to keep it running. So we've had a, a lot of people on the podcast who have started with a prescription and ended up, you know, on the streets and doing that. So what do we say to people? How do we start this conversation? Yeah. So first and foremost, I, I think just bringing this awareness, right? We what prevention science shows us is that people can become addicted in as little as seven days to an to an opioid. Um, we also know that in the past and since about the year 2000, we've become more and more aware how much opioids are prescribed, sometimes needlessly, right? Now, mm-hmm. we want to be clear here. We know that there is a place for opioids and people that are suffering with a great deal of chronic pain. Um, we know that there's a place for opioids and that they're, that they're needed. Um, but also want to be very aware that there are safe alternatives out there. And so if I'm a person in recovery and I have a child that I'm taking to the doctor, um, this happened to me even with uh, my son getting his wisdom teeth out. So let's not forget this. Yeah, Yeah. this applies to dentists as well as doctor, right? I take my son in to get Mm -hmm. his wisdom teeth extracted. Before they even did the procedure, um, they wrote him out a two-week supply of opioids. And the fact of the matter was when we got him home, all he needed was like two days of Advil every four hours hours or whatever, and Mm -hmm. he was just fine. Mm -hmm. Now, had I been under a different mindset or not know what I know because of my association with this campaign, I might have thought, well, I have to follow doctor's orders. I have this prescription. I need to go fill it. And with the best of intentions, I could have ended up with a real serious problem um, and and my son that could have been life altering for my son. About it, so you know, I, yeah. I, yeah, believe it or not, no. I said, whoa, 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 let's talk about this, and we yeah. we talked about it right there, and I could tell the doctor was great working with us, but I said, you know, I'd I'd rather we we don't even write a prescription for that. Let's let's talk about what else we can do. And he said, oh yeah, if you really need one, you can call me in later. So we went home without one, and and. I don't think, even though I do what I do for my profession, uh, a year ago, I probably would have went home with that prescription right. um, just being a good patient. You know, yeah. the, you know, you want to take good care of your kids. And so many of our guests started in adolescence from a, a surgery or an injury and uh, probably well-intentioned parents filling those prescriptions for them. Yeah, absolutely. So along those lines, you know, we'd like to use three phrases like we want to speak out, opt out and throw out, right? So when you're going to the doctor, it's important to have that conversation, advocate for your own health care. You know, they mm-hmm. may feel mm-hmm. like prescribing these things are just part 
a business of usual, it's just standard mm-hmm. procedure. Routine. So like you're saying, yeah. Matt, like speak up, you know, say like, mm-hmm. hey, Ask I have a questions. concern. And especially if you're in recovery to say um, and, and if there's intergenerational addiction mm-hmm. to say, you know, this is a concern. I want to be raw and real about that here. And what are some safe alternatives? And because I'm concerned about it for my, myself, I'm also concerned about it for my children. Um, so lock up is the other part of that. Um, you know, any local Walmart or hardware store, you know, get a little um, lockup box that if a prescription is needed, that it can be stored in there because anybody can be at risk if there if there is an opioid. And then last but certainly not least, once those prescriptions have expired, it's important um, to dispose of them carefully. How do um, people do that? So, so there are a number of different drop boxes throughout our state and communities. Um, you can go to use only as directed, uh, dot org to find different drop off locations. Somebody said put them in a dirty diaper. Oh, <laughs> That would discourage me. Yeah, me too. <laughs> that would definitely. I, I really heard that. And I yeah. don't know if maybe I'm running in weird circles, but I heard that was a good way to do it. I guess it, it works if I you have babies it, in the house. It implies house. you have a dirty diaper at your disposal. Right. <laughs> Put it. Yeah. Hey, so we, we hear that the opioids is an epidemic, and a lot of time the epidemic uh, word just gets thrown around, and they just go, they, and for you know the, the person at home, they go, oh, it must be really bad. It's an epidemic. Yeah. What is the opioid epidemic? I mean, what are the numbers? What does it really look like? Yeah, so we, we know that since the year 2000, um, that this has reached epidemic per, uh proportions here in our country. And currently it is the leading cause of deaths due to injuries for adults in the United States. Um, And we're at a point now that drug poisoning deaths have outpaced deaths due to firearms, falls, and motor vehicle crashes here in Utah. So just here in Utah. Utah. So I, I think the word epidemic does apply. I think that's important for people to know because a lot of times uh, we think, oh, some of this stuff applies to the country or other places. But here in Utah, we're, we probably have it together a little bit better. And it's it's a little disheartening but important to know that some of these things are just a, as big of a problem here or more so than other places. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're still in the top. 20 um, of use for for our country. So it's Im- it's important to know. And another thing that's important to, to know or maybe differentiate, and the reason that it's so important to talk prevention, is while adult use is right up there with some of the um, highest use in the nation, our youth rates are closer to just 2.9%. And so that's encouraging news. Mm. Um, but as children of those that are in recovery and children of addicts are increasing, it's important that we continue to have these conversations to um, use the best prevention possible so that we don't see an increase in those numbers as as those children grow up, similar um, to what Evan was saying here as as a child of somebody that was addicted and and at higher risk. You know, I think in the prescription world, the opioids, you know, they're painted as the bad boys. But they're not the only ones that our kids are abusing. They're abusing other things as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the high is the same, right? Like whether it's a, an opioid or, or heroin, the, the high is the same. And I think a lot of people are not aware of that. And again, there's maybe that perceived myth that because it is a prescription that it's somewhat safer or less addictive. But it can certainly be a gateway to um, heroin on the street. Sometimes it's more accessible or less expensive. Um, So it's important to be aware of, but certainly they're both being used. Or I think it's also important to know that um, it in and of itself, even if it doesn't lead to a harder street drug, um, can be just as damaging to the person. I mean, Evan, you talked about uh, benzodiazepines like clonopin, yeah. which is a very common prescription in, in most communities, including ours, mm-hmm. even for teenagers. And it's effective in helping anxiety, but it also m- mimics, you know, uh, intoxication from alcohol. And so. But people um, are using stimulants, sedatives, and I mean, just. Yeah, so Adderall is a common one, all the mm-hmm. stimulants, any sedative, uh, benzodiazepines like Xanax, um, of course, the opioids and. and uh, one of the things I'm glad you brought up was a lockbox. I can't tell you how often I have that conversation with parents about uh, finding any prescription. Uh, they'll say, well, which ones should I lock up? And I say, when in doubt, just lock them all up. And large quantities of over-the-counter medications, like if you got the Costco bottle of Tylenol or something like that, those sorts of things should all be locked up and 
put away because they're not for, you know, just casual use. And you also don't know who's coming into your home. You have your teenagers who may have friends that are tempted to to get a hold of any of those medications and steal them, sell them, use them. And so um, that would be one thing any parent could do today, frankly, is just get yourself a good lockbox and and lock everything up. Yes, yeah, super important. And I'm glad you brought that up even with friends. We we don't know who's coming in and out in terms of um, our children's friends and who may be at risk. I have a friend um, that lives outside of my community, but she was moving and friends were over helping, you know, mm-hmm. and in that process, somebody that was struggling with addiction saw those and they ended up being stolen um, because yeah. of that. And simply having a lot lockbox, having those secured, um, would have removed that temptation, would have, Mm -hmm. um, you know, prevented a lot lot of that. I'm Uh, good at that. Okay. Yeah. Where would you get a lockbox? Uh, I think we talked, you talked about places like like Walmart uh, or a hardware store or a a hardware store, even with a simple combination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. I think there's an old saying, locks only keep honest people out, but the reality, what that means is that a lock will discourage somebody, especially a lot of people who are struggling with addiction. They're tempted, and if they meet with a little resistance, a lock that they would have to destroy, <laughs> that they'll stop, and it gives them a chance to make a good choice. Yeah. And so while we can't guarantee that people couldn't get through our locks, it's worth starting with a good lock. They just take the whole lock box. Yeah, yeah and, and like your parents, uh, put the hinges on the inside. Yeah, yeah they learned. Right, not on the outside, because <laughs> the screwdrivers work, if that's the case. Yeah, and that may be a good way to just insert, too, that people that are experiencing a mental health crisis or are at risk for suicidality, yeah. that's usually like a very impulsive yes. move. Mm-hmm. And so if those opioids are locked up, that can be one more deterrent to buy, buy just a little bit more time um, to bring and some hope to that situation. For, for people who are tempted in a impulsive in suicide, the large quantities of painkillers, even if it's just ibuprofen, Tylenol, those things uh, should be locked up as well. You're listening to Project Recovery. More with Heidi and Use Only As Directed coming up. Two years ago, Americans watched in horror as a crisis unfolded at the Kabul airport. There's desperation and anguish. More than 80,000 Afghans have since arrived in America. But this story is still unfolding. I'm Andrea Smartin. In my new podcast, Stranger Becomes Neighbor, we'll find out what happens to these new arrivals in our communities. Who would help our newest neighbors? Follow us at kslpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen. Yeah, great point. You mentioned, could I ask, um, you mentioned that you like to talk to people about safe alternatives. Um, I, that reminded me, about 10 years ago, I have a, a good friend who is an attorney here in town, and he was going to get a shoulder surgery. And I think I joked around with him about, like, you know, I guess you're going to just take some after surgery medicine and, you know, catch watch. up on Netflix. Yeah, mm-hmm. catch up on Netflix. <laughs> and he said, oh, you know, I'm not going to do that. And I said, well, what do you mean you're not going to watch Netflix? And he said, no, I'm not going to take any of that stuff. And I said, oh, come on, you're having major sh- shoulder surgery. When he was in his early 20s, he had had a major ATV accident, uh, lots of injuries, and realized that that he had gotten hooked on those medications, had to go through a process to get off them. Uh, and to this day, when he has you know, a, a surgery or something like that, he just toughs it out. I mm-hmm. think that's not the best. All- I mean, it's better than using if you're mm-hmm. in recovery. Mm-hmm. But what are some healthy, safe alternatives besides just white knuckling it through the pain? Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you're bringing this up. So something that's important to know and was kind of new to me and something I'm advocating for in my own family is instead of going straight to opioids to use a combination of Advil and Tylenol, Mm -hmm. um, the kind of standard rule we go by is two and two. So two Advil, which are usually 200 milligrams each, and then Mm -hmm. two Tylenol, which are usually 500 milligrams each. Mm -hmm. And that combination, a lot of people have reported, has been very successful for them. Um, Other things that when you're in a lot of pain, it might kind of sound funny to say, well, meditate or, you know, do yoga. But people really do speak highly of them helping to manage chronic pain. I'm glad you're bringing that up because there's actually very good scientific research just that's come out in the last five years on specific focused mindfulness techniques 
um, to help with pain management. Yeah. And that really has shown re- great outcomes for people, not just to help them not use, but really to manage their pain effectively. Right. Yeah. It could kind of sound hokey or whatever, like just go medicate. Yeah. I know yeah. that you're in pain. We so, certainly don't want to sound... Um, uncompassionate about yeah. about pain and how oh. how it is but especially when it's chronic to um you know get in the habit of using a lot of those pra- practices can help mm-hmm. offset that need um for heavy opioids now heidi when you started uh, your conversation you said you guys were taking on prevention through the lens of recovery what does yeah. that mean so this is a great angle um, to speak about prevention. And, you know, as I was hearing Evan talk earlier, um, you know, so much of what is done in recovery is what we're trying to create in prevention. So when we're talking about prevention, we're talking about avoiding the onset of youth. And I can't think of any better advocates for prevention than those in recovery. Those in recovery know the cost. Um, and and so this is why it's an important lens. And And so let's say that we're talking to our kids about prevention, right? Um, What we want people to know is um, that oftentimes um, we think that using scare tactics are the most effective, right? Like my kid is not going to use. And so to tell them, I'm going to tell them the blood and guts of my addiction, right? What the prevention research shows us is that that is much less effective and in uh, and in most cases can actually even do harm or induce Kinda some like the old trauma. scared straight the whole scared right. straight thing what Didn't is work. yeah exactly nope what is effective and in a prior uh, podcast I so appreciated um, you know understanding that the opposite of addiction is connecting connectedness and what prevention science shows us is that the number one protective factor for a substance abuse disorder or for even the onset of use is a strong sense of connectedness. So for folks in recovery, as they're learning um, different strategies, life skills, go home, have that conversation with their kids. And it's okay to be open and honest and say, I have struggled with this addiction, but let's talk about your dreams for the future. And let's talk about the cost of this addiction, um, how it affects relationships, how it affects employment, how it affects any dreams of of college or sports or things like that. Um, And for a parent to say, I care about your hopes and dreams enough that we're going to have this ongoing conversation. I want to be an active part of teaching you some life skills that I'm learning, maybe things I wish I would have known sooner. And Casey, like you said earlier, if we could go back, you know, that we we would maybe change those things. But this idea of being able to play it forward um, is one of those cliches that I really like, that we're playing it forward. When we know better, we do better, right? So we're going to share these life strategies, these life skills with our kids to increase Increase connectedness and thus protect them against what, use. What about um, parents who who would say like, "Well, I, I feel like a hypocrite, or my child has called me a hypocrite." Well, you 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 smoked and you drank yeah. and you did these things and you turned out okay. You're, yeah, yeah, look you, at you. You're yeah. doing okay. Like, what would you know? What would you say that? What should a, how should a parent respond? Yeah, to that? these can be difficult conversations, and we know that they're brought up. Um, but I would encourage you to to go back to that conversation of being honest about it. Say, hey, you're right. I used Let's, honest, but how not honest? But again, not with the blood and guts or what we right. like to call the war stories. Right. Just to remember, those fear tactics don't war work. Stories kind of romanticize yeah. something glorify. awful. You glorify and, we, and, and yeah. kind of increase curiosity, right? right? right, right. Um, especially with teenagers that are that yeah. are prone to that high adrenaline. But um, I think that, that goes to, thing. to being honest with yourself and with your kids, you yeah. know? I mean, you, you go, you, you know, I feel like I've, I've got it together now more than I've had in a while, but for a while it wasn't good. Yeah. And, you know, I, here's some of the things that you didn't know about because you were a kid and I was trying to save you from them. But, no, there were some real ugly times. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I think well, a lot of times you want to – to, to downplay it, you know, especially when you're coming out on the other side, you know, because you don't want to be vulnerable and you don't want to share and you don't want to say, hey, this was no, this was ugly. I was in a dark, dark yeah. place. Yeah. But you I, you skip over that when you get into recovery. A lot of times when talking to your kids, or at least I have at some point and go, no, I, I'm doing better now. But you don't realize how bad it was. So what I hear you saying is 
you admit to the issue, you know, the problems that you've had without glorifying it, without telling the war stories, and maybe try to spend the majority of your time focusing on how sobriety is helping your life right now and, and talk about coping skills. Is, is that what? Absolutely. And I think to... Casey hit the nail on the head there when he said vulnerability, right? It's ah, a vulnerable conversation it is. to have. But when, we, when we're vulnerable with other people, we're enhancing and strengthening that connection with them, right? And we can be vulnerable about the cost mm-hmm. and about our grief in that cost that we've had to pay and then simultaneously say, but let's talk about you know, some strategies, some life skills, I'm going to, as a parent, I'm going to have rules in place because I care about you and I care about the healthy development of your body and you reaching your dreams and goals for the future. I have rules for you. And, and to say, you might think that makes me a hypocrite, but in my eyes, this makes me a better parent. And, you know, when you've talked to some people in recovery, they will say, and and Evan, maybe you can um, relate to this to say, I wish my parents would have set rules for me because I would have known that they cared. No, see, my, my parents <laughs> set rules yeah. and they told me not to. And when I said you drink, they said it's because I said so. You know, that was their standard. Mm-hmm. And, you know, being older now, looking back, and it was because my parents didn't want to have that conversation with me. Right. They didn't want to sit down yeah. and be open and honest. It was just when we were kids, you didn't do it because I said so. And, and yeah. we're not having a conversation about it. This is not open for discussion. I'm the parent, you're the kid, and you do what I say. And that kind of reflected the time. That probably applied to almost everything, right? That's, yeah. That's why you do your chores. That's why you go right. to bed. Because I said so. Time. Yeah, because I said yeah. so. And for whatever reasons, that has really changed. I think effective parenting has ditched that because I said so mentality. Yeah. Right? You know, we sh- we show in prevention science that there's two vital parts of that that are really important. The one is very clear standards about healthy behavior. So that would be clear rules, right? And that's where you're talking about 20, 30 years ago, it was because I said so. Yeah. But there's another super important component to that. And that is a real sense of bonding and connectedness with our kids. And that maybe is what was missing. Um, right. But if when you couple the two, when you have very clear rules about healthy behavior, and a great sense of bonding, which I think is Again, incorporated when you get vulnerable, when you're mm-hmm. honest and sincere about the reasons that yeah. you're sharing, um, that's when kind of the sweet sauce really happens. And we're increasing the likelihood of our kids adhering to those rules when we take the time to be vulnerable and bond with them that way. So use only as directed. If people want more information about all of the things that you've talked about today and maybe put this on their tabs to have a quick resource of some of this, where would they go? They want yeah. some sweet sauce? Yeah, some hear? sweet yeah. sauce. Yeah. I was Parenting thinking that too. Sauce. I was like, <laughs> I want to start using the word sweet, sweet sauce. sauce. Yeah. Yeah. It just rolls, rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet sauce. So they can visit useonlyasdirected.org for some, some great resource. And saving it as a tab would be a great idea. And I want to bring Evan back in real quick because yeah. I followed you guys on Facebook. Facebook yeah. And uh, I noticed up in Ogden you just started your first Heroin Anonymous meeting. Yeah. yeah. So we just opened a, a new office in Ogden. So um, we have offices in Salt Lake City, um, St. George, uh, uh, Price and Ogden. And so um, we have, uh, they're all recovery, what we call recovery community centers. People can come by um, and uh, visit us. Uh, we've got peer recovery coaches at all of those locations. All of our services are completely free and open to the public. We never charge anyone any money or ask for insurance of information of any kind. We're a free community resource. Because we get often people reaching out to us on Facebook. Yeah, and frustrated because yeah. they yeah. feel like or they assume I've got to have a lot of money or a great insurance plan to, to get help. No. So if somebody's just out there and they're struggling and they and they, and they need some direction, USAR is a great place just to go to get that. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that, that's why we exist as a recovery community organization is to help people find those resources that are going to help them find and sustain long-term recovery. And Another thing I found interesting was when I was in Pinnacle Recovery Center, you know, we'd go to meetings every day. And someday, you know, I was in there for alcohol. People are in there for opioids. People are in there for meth. And they did a good job of taking us to all these different meetings. But, you know, I mean, it was Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, sure. Heroin non- non- Anonymous. Uh, Swedish Fish Anonymous. Swedish Fish Anonymous. <laughs> but, I mean, 
are they that different? I mean, because I felt like I was in there for alcohol, but I really like the guys over at Cocaine Anonymous. Yeah. You know, I mean, if it just... It, uh, the, <laughs> so you had a little more energy. There were a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean? No, but... I mean, but it, uh, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Their meetings are very entertaining. They are fun. Yeah. I mean, they were a little they're, flippant. They, yeah, you know, they're they irreverent. They a little bit more. Yeah. And they're reverent. And I went, yeah. okay, yeah. I, I think I think I like these Those guys. people. And yeah. I didn't know, it was like, I, do I have to go get a cocaine problem now nope. to get in here? No, absolutely not. You can... You can you're, you're welcome at any of those fellowships. So, um, and... Uh, and, and and they're pretty clear about that, that you don't have to be in recovery from a cocaine, uh, you know, addiction to, to be there. Like, but I think they're pretty clear yeah. about it once you're inside the walls of the rooms. What I'm saying is for the people out there, mm-hmm. you know, that maybe don't want to go to a 12-step meeting because there's a right. certain vibe or this. I mean, really, go – yeah, test drive them. Yeah, explore your options because there's different, yeah. you know, different things are going to work for different people. Um, you know, like my recovery probably looks a lot different than yours, um, and that's okay, right? There's many ways up that mountain. Um, uh, you know, and, and some of those paths are more well trod than others. It just it doesn't mean that they're better or worse. It just means that more people have done it. Um, but recovery is not rare. Recovery is not random. Um, recovery is happening all around us all the time. And I think that the amazing thing about recovery is that um, you know people in recovery. Uh, as they change, we change others. So changed people change people. See, more of those good sayings. I know. I'm, we're, I'm thinking of T-shirt ideas right now. <laughs> right? <laughs> the sweet sauce. Yeah. Change people, change people. <laughs> Man, we, we got to get on this. Let's start writing this down, Josh. Bumper stickers. <laughs> hey, so let's let everybody have a final thought. So, Heidi, one more time, what would people need to know about Use Only As Directed? Yeah, so for some great prevention resources, um, go to useonlyasdirected.org. Remember to start that conversation with your doctor. Um, have that conversation in your families. Um, um, and and get on the prevention end of things. Be um, great advocates and heroes for your kids in that sense. All right, Evan with you, Sarah. Yeah, and if, if you or a loved one is struggling with a substance use disorder, um, please reach out for help. Um, uh, we can be found at uh, myusara.com, so M-Y-U-S-A-R-A.com. All right, and Matt, what does USARA stand for? <sighs> it stands for... <laughs> You're a Utah doctor. support advocates for recovery <laughs> awareness. Final awesome. thoughts. It. Final thoughts with you. <laughs> Final thoughts. Uh, EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing Therapy. Perfect. Thanks, Doctor right? Google. <laughs> and I want to draw. <laughs> I want to draw attention to an actual T-shirt in the room. Evan, tell us what your T-shirt oh. says. Uh, so my, my shirt says "Sharing Without Shame," and so um, it's a it's a shirt that I picked up at the Overdose Awareness event uh, last year, um, and uh, it's it's got a picture of um, a bunch of, of folks um, in the state of Utah that that died of a result of an opioid overdose, and uh, including some some friends. And so it yeah. uh, means a lot to me. I'm so sorry, man. Yeah, but you know, I think that. That's the message that uh, I appreciate, Evan, and so many of our guests coming in and sharing without shame really creates a community. It touches people's lives. I think that plus, uh, and and one of my favorite topics is prevention, and people who come in and work with me uh, know that that's something that we work on a lot in the office. And so that's the magic combination, having effective resources led by competent people for people who need to get into recovery, but also really taking prevention into uh, schools, homes, in the community. Uh, this has been one of my very favorite episodes because we're hitting both ends of the spectrum so effectively today. I just love it. And what I think it shows is that community is a vital part to recovery. Absolutely. And Utah has a very strong community. And what we're doing is trying to bring awareness to that community. And there are lifelines out there. There are people that want to help. And you just have to to get out there and and want it. Yeah, I feel like excuses are running thin with so many um, good people out there willing to help. So thank you very much for taking your time today and listening to this podcast. If you know somebody who needs some help, have them do what I did. Give Pinnacle Recovery Center a call. Uh, I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. That's Evan. That's Heidi. You're listening to Project Recovery, a KSL podcast.